everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are. Um, thank you very much for... for thank you for joining us. This is June the 6th. It's a Wednesday. It's the first Wednesday in June, so it is webinar time, right? We are the Global OER Graduate Network, so I see lots of um, names I, I don't uh, recognize. So um, just very briefly, so GoGN, or the Global OER Graduate Network, is a network of PhD candidates uh, who are doing their, their um, research on an aspect of, of open education. So the students are at the core, you know, the, the, the main core of, of the network, but around the students we've got um, like a much bigger number of, of um, friends of the network, expert, experts in, in open education. Um, and uh, we come together uh, once a month for a webinar. It's an opportunity sometimes for, so for one of our researchers to, to present their work in progress. All the times, which is the case now, uh, we've got friends uh, of the Goji and we've got experts uh, like Robin joining us. So, Today, I'm super extra happy. I'm always happy because I love these webinars. But, uh, today, I'm even super extra more happier than ever uh, because we've got with us uh, uh, Robin De Rosa. I don't think she needs an introduction, but uh, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to say this, don't, don't take offense. I mean, Robin, I don't know if you've ever met her in, in person. She's kind of, she's kind of petite. Uh, so, but she's she's a mountain of a woman when it comes to open education, and I've been following her work now since the time of the the uh, the anthology of of early literature, English American literature. So uh, I'm delighted she's with us today. Uh, I think you probably also delighted. So that's it. I give you the floor. Or I'll give you the screen. Thanks, Robin. Thank you. Yeah, I love. I just got called a mountain of a woman. I this like I should just log off now because I'm not going to get better than that. Um, I'm so happy to be here with this um, the invitation of this particular group because over the years I've always seen the tweets coming out and the work that the group's been producing and kind of just the community of scholars. Um, that it's encouraged. It's a very positive vibe online um, to watch this group emerge. So I was really happy to to get asked to come here. And um, I know, like a couple of my friends on Facebook were like, "Oh, we're so excited! We're going to watch this recording because we don't understand anything about what you do." <laughs> but I think. Um, this is probably not going to be a great session for people who don't know much about open necessarily because I really value the opportunity of talking to people who are kind of deeply immersed in in research and practice around open. So I'm going to show you some of the slides that I use a lot of times when I do faculty development in particular, but I'm going to go really quickly through them because I think, you know, you're not learning this stuff. I think it's more about learning how I might present it to get a sense of what the um, options are for how we talk about open. So I'm going to go really quickly. And then, of course, if you have any questions at all um, about the slides or the presentation, you can ask those at the end. But more so, I'm just looking forward to getting through them and having a conversation, um, whether it's by chat or whatever, so to hear what questions you might have, particularly about the intersections that I'm interested in, which is where open education crosses public education and where both of those kind of cross the idea of pedagogy and, and how pedagogy can change our relationship to the publics that education wants to serve. So um, I'm just going to start going through, and I think everybody can see the slide. I'll keep an eye on the chat there, so just let me know if you see any technical problems. But I'm going to start with um, kind of how I got into Open in the first place. After learning about Creative Commons and working a little bit on my own Open project that I'll talk about in a minute, I was at an early Open Ed conference, and I was, you know, kind of awestruck by what was going on, but I was also sort of puzzled because I had come out of sort of a very academic research heavy world and suddenly I was like in these sessions about textbooks and it was actually not interesting to me. I was not 
um, compelled to care a lot about the whole narrative of reducing cost around textbooks. Um, and I, I wrote a little blog post that was called Textbooks Ugh um, that I don't think anyone had ever shared anything I wrote anywhere on Twitter before that conference. And I was so shocked when all of a sudden people started sharing that like crazy at the conference. And it was a little scary to sort of come into open a bit as a voice of dissent sort of saying, what, what is our animating idea here in open? Is it really reducing costs on textbooks? Um, because I'm not sure that's the rallying cry that really inspires me. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the rallying cries that do inspire me, and this is really not that graph. Um, so I like this graph. I use it a lot. Uh, I also use the one that has like the healthcare costs, which you know run in the middle of those two lines, um, because you know people get shocked, and it is shocking. And um, I also have been fairly critical of the commercial textbook industry. Um, I like, I, these are not my words here, it's from The Economist, but I don't mind calling it price gouging. Um, so I, I think that's sort of okay, but I'm more interested maybe in shifting the narrative away from cost, because I think the problem with the cost narrative is that it's appealing to cut costs in higher education, and many people want to do that right now. But lots of the ways that we cut costs in higher education are not um, things that as a community I think the folks I work with in open would really support right we cu cost cutting in higher education is a very dark side so cutting costs alone is not really um, a motivating factor what I think is more motivating for me is the idea that we're increasing access to knowledge and access to education and that's really different than other kinds of cost savings measures, right? Like if we curtail library hours or cut faculty and uh, increase the number of contingent um, faculty teaching courses, none of those things increase access to knowledge or the quality of education that our students get when they come to the table. So changing the narrative from pure cost cutting to thinking more about access became important to me as I started learning about things like textbook costs. Um, so when I started thinking about access more broadly, I started thinking textbooks are part of a constellation of effects that make knowledge inaccessible for various learners. Um, when we talk about textbooks, I, I like to use the Florida Virtual Study a lot because I think this is one of the places where faculty in particular can see that what we're, we're not talking about some abstract thing in textbook costs. We're talking specifically about social justice and about things that in colleges we're very concerned about now. Things like um, retention and completion, the ability to get a credential after you have a, accumulated the debt to go to college, for example. So the Florida Virtual Campus, that's the slide as a faculty member that that made me go, oh my God, you know, I got to care about textbooks, which I never cared about before. Because if, for example, large percentages of our students are, you know, failing or withdrawing from classes because they can't afford the learning materials, that's actually about access to, to college, right? That's about access to learning. It's not an abstract cost or something like lowering the heat in order to drive down uh, uh, costs in a building, right? This is directly related to the academic endeavor that they're engaged in. And of course, with OER, um, the sort of frustrating thing is that many of the problems that we see emerge in the Florida Virtual Study could be solved yesterday if faculty would just consider adopting um, open textbooks, particularly in these high yield, expensive courses. So, Switching to access to knowledge rather than sheer cost transformed a lot of things about how I teach, not just now I use OER. So I do use all and only OER at this point. But beyond that, um, you can see here this highly impressive food pantry that I have built out of a tiny bookcase, um, which makes it like I built a bookcase. I didn't even do that. Um, but that's right outside my office door. We also have a big 
food pantry at our university, but I wanted to kind of talk about and make visible to my staff and my students that food insecurity, for example, is an academic issue. If you can't, uh, if you're hungry and you can't feed yourself, you are not going to be able to come to the table to learn early American literature. Um, once I started thinking about how textbook costs preclude learning, there was no reason to stop there, right? So I had to do a lot of my work in my program around how veterans pay for college because the GI Bill had some complex interactions with the customized major program that I run. Uh, we also started a transportation co-op and a child care co-op inside of our academic department um, to help relieve some of the pressures with transportation and child care. Uh, we moved all of our courses to hybrid and evening courses to be more uh, flexible for adult learners and parents. We started a laptop checkout program that would allow students to get um, device, access to devices so that they could have access to our OER. We changed our grading methods to allow for more flexibility in deadlines and revision. We opened a, a help center that's open on Sundays and Monday nights. We started accommodating students in a more radical way so that, you know, if a student needed, for example, a disability accommodation or if a, we had a couple of students who were severely ill this last semester, when we dealt with illness, when we dealt with neurodivergent students who um, learn in different ways, what we would do is we would take that student as kind of a case study for shifting how we deliver curriculum throughout the program. So instead of thinking of accommodation as an individual learner issue, like this kid can't afford a textbook, this woman is vision impaired, you know, and needs a, um, an accommodation for accessibility with the textbook. Anytime those things came up, we used it as, as an opportunity to design, redesign the program, um, not just the, the way that student traveled through it. Um, it's, this is not a, a fixed thing. We don't fix one thing after another. It's a process and approach to education. And textbooks for me are a part of this. And this for me is the accessibility at the core of open. It's not about textbooks. It's about making knowledge and learning accessible um, to more learners. And then, of course, for all of us in open, it's the, it's the five R's at the core um, that also make a big difference for pedagogy. So that's what I'm going to spend most of my time talking about not just access to knowledge, but access to knowledge creation, which I think is so important right now because I don't know about, you know, everybody's in different um, regions and countries and all of this is inflected a little differently by context. But certainly in the US right now and certainly in the UK, um, we're seeing a real move towards workforce preparedness, job training, and one of the problems I have with that narrative is that we train students to be successful in a labor market, but we don't, we don't invite students to transform the labor market that they'll graduate into. So the five R's for me are part of a more complex um, approach to education that asks students to contribute to the shape of knowledge so that when they graduate, the world will, you know, at least in some small way, hold a trace of what they've put into it. Um, so a lot of this started for me, this is kind of a, you can read that slide as a loop because there, there's not animation here, but um, this is narrative of that first project that I did in open education, which was uh, to create an open anthology of early American literature, public domain literature that students were paying a lot of money for through a commercial textbook. Um, and this I built with I, I think I left, but now I'm back. Hello, friends. Um, so this is uh, uh, the Open Anthology of Early American Literature, student-created. When we first built it, um, the students were super psyched that they had saved $90, uh, but they were not psyched with the quality of the material because it didn't have footnotes or maps or introductions, explanatory ancillary materials. So as a response to that crisis, which is really what happened, we were in the course and it was crappy, um, we worked together as a team, the students and I, um, and particularly the students, to write the materials that were missing from the primary sources that we had gathered. 
once I saw that the students were actually more engaged with this open anthology than they had been with the commercial anthology because they were helping to author it, I was like, it's a pedagogy win, you know, that I hadn't planned. So you can see there in the corner, that's Jonathan making a video about um, the Haitian Revolution, right? He, it, it was kind of like, what can you do? Whatever you can do, can you make maps? Can you build infographics? You want to look up glossary terms? You want to write discussion questions? Put it in the textbook, right? So all the previously disposable assignments now had a place to live, and that really brought the class to life. Um, you can see a little bit, if you squint, uh, that, that I layered Hypothesis, um, which is an annotation app, into the book so students could engage with each other more publicly. The book was published online, which meant that other universities started using it and the students were actually getting their work read and they were interacting in Hypothesis with other learners and that was really animating also. Uh, people started in a sort of GitHub sense, like forking the anthology. So you can see uh, Abby Good there, that's one of my colleagues who forked it over and made a much better version than um, our first beta version with my students. Um, and now, of course, that anthology, not of course, you know, like you're all following this in your personal lives, but now this anthology has been picked up by Rebus Community, which is a a really wonderful new ecosystem for building OER. Um, and they got funded by Hewlett, and um, Tim Robbins is now the editor of, of the managing editor for this um, kind of remix and, and revision and augmentation of my students' original project. And when they finish the anthology later this year, it's going to replace not only the Heath anthology that I used to use, but the Norton Anthology of American Literature, the Bedford St. Martin, like all the commercial textbooks in the field. It's going to be a, a game changer, I think, and a really high quality material, which is why I don't freak out about putting low quality materials into the commons. Um, I'm, a, I'm the queen of a disclaimer. You know, people say, don't, don't put a disclaimer on your work. Put a disclaimer. Say, this, this work isn't that good, um, but it's a really great idea. It's a really nice seed. I'm going to plant it and the commons will come together um, to improve it. So that first anthology that we built was instrumental, even though, you know, was it high quality? It, it depends how you define that, right? It was a high quality seed, um, a very high quality seed that's really, um, you know, engendered a lot of projects, not just this Rebus version. Uh, on its own as an artifact, people ask me all the time, can I, can I, can you give me the link to that? I want to use that book. And I'm like, don't use that book. Like that, that artifact is not interesting anymore. There's others that are better. Um, I actually make uh, textbooks with students for all my classes now. So I've done it for a first year seminar. Um, we're in the middle of a three year build of a new interdisciplinary studies theory textbook that my program is building. So the students in the intro and the capstone course work every semester to build that out, improve it, curate, revise, edit, all the work involved in that. Um, it's live on the web, but it's in progress. So, you know, is it good now? I mean, it's a good community. It's a great pedagogical tool. It's not a good artifact yet, but it will be. Um, so I want to just talk briefly about kind of this little flow chart I created for my brain about what all of this means. And, I spent a lot of time in these kind of three middle domains of teaching, the transmission of knowledge, like my content area, helping students understand the material so they could ask critical questions about it, they're not just regurgitating it, and then maybe they could even apply it, right, to a current event or um, a slightly different context. And I spent like two decades in higher ed teaching in those three domains and thinking that that was all there was. And it was fine, it was good, but I have these other domains now. One of them is this first domain, which is, you know, in order for students to come to the table to access knowledge, what other things have to be in place? Can they afford the gas to get to class? Do they have broadband access? Um, are my materials um, accessible if they've got some kind of a learning disability or impair impairment or other, other way of, of interacting with the materials. Can they afford the learning materials? Um, are they hungry? Are, do they have a place to sleep the night before? So that survival domain has become to me an academic issue 
totally part of um, my responsibilities as a researcher and a, and a professor with a PhD who never thought this was their job. For me now, it's, it's an integral part of my job. Um, but then, of course, on the other end is this open pedagogy stuff that really excites me. After students learn to apply knowledge, where can that go? How can they contribute out their new ways of seeing things to help change their field, to help change the publics, to help change um, uh, the world that they are a part of? Um, that kind of transformative piece, which is the students as contributors model that we're all familiar with in, in open. But what I really wanted to know is like, if we're going to say that that's what we do, what do the architectures need to look like in order to help us do that? Because it's a good thing this is not like so much in the shop because I'm like all hands, but maybe it's, it's better if I do it like this, then you can't see because I feel like you must all be getting motion sickness with me going like this. Um, so anyway, that, that's where I am now is, is thinking about architecture, structures, programs, institutions, systems, a little bit more than I'm thinking about like an assignment like I like I used to or a project. So I talk sometimes about the LMS, you know, Blackboard, Moodle, Canvas, whatever you got, um, as, as like an Alcatraz, um, like a prison. It's locked down. It's hard to get in. It's hard to get out. You, de you delete all your student work at the end of the semester. And, and actually, that's the thing that really got me, right, was the symbolics of that sort of ceremonial deletion as you import your course for the next semester and you realize that your students work is not important to the future of, of your course. How can, how can 25 or 40, 50, 100 students work as hard as they can and think as much as they can for an entire semester and then nothing's changed? Like, what, what is that? That's not, I, that's, not the, that's not the vision I have for open or for education. So I started thinking, like, I want students to build, you know, and you all get the inflection here, domains of their own, right? Domains of their own that they can, um, that they can customize toward their field, toward their goals, toward their passions. And instead of surrounding that by shark-infested waters like the LMS, We'll surround that with pathways and roads that invite other people in as collaborators with, with the student work. Um, so of course, I, I am pretty active using the domain of one's own uh, program, which is really just a, a particular institutional version um, and a fancy way of saying my students all work on the open web. But when I say all work, that's not quite true because agency is sort of the core of what we're developing when we're developing our students' relationships to the digital world and, and, the, and the connected world. So some of my students do choose to stay in the LMS. Um, I have a couple of students actually who work more or less one-on-one -on -one with me via email. And we're back. Uh, there's a host of reasons why students uh, shouldn't or wouldn't want to work on the open web, and, and we respect those. But most of our students are working um, on what we call their ePorts. I changed that in, uh, term from ePortfolio to suggest that we're not looking at kind of like a headshot mentality, like, you know, your best photo and your CV and your one really good research paper. We're talking about a lab where uh, a port, a port of call or a portal where students can invite mentors, collaborators, critics into their spaces and ask them to help them improve their thinking and learning. Um, that's the kind of web I try to model for my students. It's an imperfect web in lots of ways. The quality of the work is imperfect sometimes, but also the technologies are highly imperfect. Uh, my program uses a lot of Twitter um, and I am probably the biggest critic that my students will ever hear about the use of commercial tools like Twitter and the algorithms that power them. Um, so despite the imperfections of working in, a, in an open web um, and the challenges with um, all sorts of, of issues around that that we can talk about if you want, uh, I do find that the move to make students 
sort of um, owners of their own web space uh, is very powerful, if for no other reason than at the end of the semester, that work lives with them and not with the course that's just going to flush it away. Um, and I think the symbolics of that have been transformative for my own program. Here's a couple of student examples of students talking about this. Um, Madison, uh, and, and this is all public on their, on their websites, but uh, Madison had a child when she was 17 in high school and had never planned to go to college, um, certainly never thought she would graduate from college. Um, she's an interesting case because a lot of the sort of accessibility work that we did in our program helped Madison um, to sort of successfully complete college. But the thing that really excited her about being in our program, besides the fact that we had done a lot of things to make it accessible for uh, single parents and adult learners and uh, community college transfer students, which was big for us, was also that you know she was really transformed by working in this kind of connected learning environment that we developed, where she became um, somebody that lots of people started to follow about, uh, she writes about women's health and particularly about sex education in the United States, using her own um, experiences as a young mother and a young mother trying to go to school. And it was her writing about that in public that actually brought lots of readers to her. And um, uh, she ended up winning a big award from our university for her work. And I think had it not had that public aspect and the engagement of the networks of people that were interacting with her, I'm not so sure that that work would have had the power that it had for Madison and for um, our university. I love that she kind of scorns the word homework in this in this quote. We don't post our homework to a hidden website, you know, like the like Blackboard or Moodle. Um, Homework is not a word that even has resonance in our program anymore because it's not hoop jumping practice for some other real thing that will happen later. It's just work. You know, they're they're doing real work the way all of us are doing real work. Um, this is Becca. Uh, she talks about the non-traditional pedagogical approaches. Basically, my program, it's no secret, everybody knows. It's an open pedagogy program, right? It's a, that's the, the core of what we do. And she says this allows for non-traditional pedagogical approaches that spark a fire in students who are sick of typical classroom structure, which she then describes. You probably know what kind of structure I'm talking about. Memorizing vocab words to do well on weekly quizzes, submitting assignments to Moodle that disappear when you graduate. Meaningless engagement with the work we produce. That quote just kind of makes me fall over, right? Like, meaninglessly engaged is how she quantifies the experience of being in those kind of hoop jumping experiences. So yes, you're doing the work. You might even be getting an A. Um, so you're there, you're present. But that sense of having meaning um, is lost for them. So for me, this was all kind of a really exciting deepening of my relationship to open. The cost of books was a, an interesting entrance, but I don't think I would have stayed for that. Um, it was really the social justice piece of making knowledge more accessible and then helping my students become engaged in the creation and transformation of knowledge that seemed to me um, to be a radical act. And that's the piece that I'm really enjoying with my students and um, I've some of the stuff I'm thinking about lately like just in terms of you guys being sort of the, the new and emerging experts in, in open the things that are are keeping me awake awake at night maybe in a productive way you know Audrey has some new uh, Audrey Waters has some new challenges um, about per, what she calls permissionlessness so what she's interested in, I think, is um, how sharing cultures function in a technology environment that is so highly oppressive. So what happens with work being co-opted? What happens with um, networks that are controlled, that, that look free and open, 
but are really controlled by, by very complex algorithms um, that uh, disenfranchise our most vulnerable learners or even our most vulnerable teachers, right? The contingent labor that's asked to engage in the creation of OER and is compensated for the creation of OER. Um, what kind of consent needs to be in place in order to make sharing valuable, right? This is why I would never force a student to put an open license on something or force a student to create a blog or even ask a student to create a blog before they would be able to answer the question for themselves, why, why share? How does this help me? How does this help the world? What's the point? Um, for me, being an advocate for internet privacy is kind of core to the work in open. Um, can we have open without privacy? Um, and the core of that word, hello. The core of that word privacy is private. So I'm really interested in like how do privates and publics interact because I'm so interested in creating what we might think of as a knowledge commons, um, particularly for our public institutions. So how do we think about privacy being a core uh, investment for people who want to see healthy publics? So the, the idea I've come to for thinking about this is uh, the commons, um, is sort of a, a, a thing that I'm trying to toss around. I was really inspired by David Bollier's keynote at open ed this last year. Um, he makes the distinction, you know, people attack the idea of the commons. Um, sometimes we call it the tragedy of the commons. The idea of like, oh, if my meadow is free to graze, um, uh, people are just going to come in and overgraze it and the meadow is going to die and like open doesn't work, right? You, you know, sharing it doesn't work. But David Bollier sort of suggests, you know, we're not talking about like a, a free for all regime here because what happens when you do that is that the most powerful really capitalist forces come in and strip mine you know a little bit like um like nestle and water you know like bottling up a precious resource and selling it back to communities who have contaminated water right that's not the kind of open we want we don't want resources to just be strip mined by the most powerful we need to build a commons that has an infrastructure to it um, that is based on social justice. So what I spend a lot of time now is thinking about like, what the hell does that look like, right? Like, what kind of internet do you need for that? What kind of teaching do we do? And what kind of conversations do we have to introduce our students to in order to help them help us build it? Um, that's kind of my plan, right? I, I don't think I can build this thing. Like, I can barely conceive of it. But I bet a student of mine or a student of my student's student could help do this work. So I'm trying to plant the questions with my students more than answer them. And uh, economist Jim, Jim Luke, who writes a lot of open, uh, he's a community college professor, um, he talks about commons as a verb. Right? It's not that we're going to get a commons or make a commons or there is a commons. It's that we need two commons and we need to ask questions that point to the commons and do work that aspires to a commons. And um, we need to critique the idea of an easy commons. Um, so it's not about proselytizing as much as it is about process. Um, so that's the stuff that I'm playing with. Uh, that's the final slide, which is kind of like question open, you know, like we don't know what we need or what this could be. Um, but I'm pretty sure that if we focus exclusively on textbook costs, we lose some of what for me really are the social justice um, inspirations that make this a much larger educational project. Um, so, so here we go. Uh, I was going to say question, and I already see the first one popping up from Sarah in the chat. I worry about knowledge commons. Sounds like more privilege. I'm really keen on knowledge diversity. I think that's ex I think that's great. I mean, I, I think 
privilege is one of the big tensions in open for me. Um, and there are actually lots of folks whose work I really respect um, who really won't even engage with the term at all because they they see it um, they see open as being helpful to people who already have a kind of privilege and potentially potentially really destructive to people who don't enjoy it and a kind of to, who don't enjoy privilege but a kind of um, on the ground way of thinking about that in pedagogy I'll, I'll give you an example when I was first starting doing this work I was you know kind of classically naive like a lot of us are and was doing that whole thing that a lot of us did 10 years ago like make a blog because we should all have blogs you know because everybody should blog because blogging's good right so I had a student you know we were I made a class blog and my students were all on there and I had a student it turned out who was in the section she had just transferred to my university from another university and she had transferred because she had to flee her home because of a domestic violence situation. And suddenly, all this lame stuff about like, oh, your digital footprint, you know, and who do you want to be on the web, and collaborative learning in public where other students are going to be making you visible, regardless of how you make yourself visible. All of a sudden, when she came to me after class and told me her story, I realized, like, oh my God, what am I, what things have I not even thought about, you know, as I march my students, you know, into this, into this space. Um, and that little tiny moment really helped me understand later when scholars who are much smarter than me started pushing back um, with privacy issues, you know, people like, Chris Gilliard, whose work has really transformed my thinking about data privacy and also who has access um, to the privilege of being open. Um, so I, I think that's great. And I'm looking for vocabulary that that really puts um, social justice at the at the core. I, I I'd like that to be open. I'd like there to be no other open but the open that thinks social justice is a core value. Um, but if that doesn't happen, I, I'm Sarah Goldrick Rabb has a great quote. She writes a lot about um, higher ed accessibility uh, and social uh, socioeconomic um, inequality. She has this great quote where she says, "Like I'm done being loyal to institutions. Now I'm loyal to students." And that's kind of how I feel about conceptual frameworks. Like I'm not loyal to them anymore. I'm loyal to like learners and the real stuff that impedes learning and if I have to you know disinvest from particular um, you know ways of conceptualizing something I will because I'm trying to be truly driven by learners um, which like if you do that is such a it's such a ra it really is a radical act to design around students, which I think our accessibility teams have known for a long time, um, and they've been trying to tell us that. But the rest of us think of student-centered design. We've sort of polluted that idea. Um, it really doesn't center students. So when I try to put the students at the center, more of this stuff comes together for me. But but yeah, open is a is tricky. Um, I'm reading Sarah here. Um, I've never had a chance to, and Lord knows I tried for many years. I'd love to know if anybody else has made this work in other areas. Yeah, I, do, I don't know the answer to that. Um, am I right that these, <laughs> these people cannot speak? Is that right? They're, it's just going to be in the chat? Yes, I'm afraid okay. I have to mute them, otherwise it will collapse. So. Yes. That's I. I think the symbolics of this are so fabulous too, right? Like it will be too crazy if you all talk, but uh, but we appreciate the the irony of that. Um, so anyway, I you know keep using the chat, and I'll try to um, you know I guess keep talking back. But but yeah, the talk about student-centered design is scratching the surface. 
I had this thing where I thought, what if we only did one thing, right? What if, because this would work at my institution, what if we only did one thing and that one thing was we looked at our mission statements for our institutions and we demanded that we do them. Whatever it says, you do. We took it for real. So, you know, I think a lot of times when we say student-centered, we mean in my class, students talk, right? Like there's discussion. It's not just lecture. Um, but what would happen if you're going to use a radical phrase like student-centered, what would happen if you actually required people to mean it and you put like a students at the center? I mean, I'm a pretty radical professor in a lot of ways, and even in my classes, students only occasionally are truly centered, right? Because it's such a, it's such an, um, a, a, a paradigm shift to do that. But can I, can I come in one second? Because um, that reminded me um, while everybody, so guys, think of a question, a question, but I'm, I'm gonna, since I can't speak. <laughs> um, it's just that that reminded me what something that happened to me uh, recently enough. Um, and I think it's a bit of a sad story and it's kind of related to all this, right? So I was doing a bit of work for the UK Open Textbooks project. So what we're trying to do is see how the arguments that you use in the States to adopt an open textbook, how does that transfer to the UK? Can we use the same kind of argument? And that's when it gets very interesting because you can't really just talk about cost. Uh, because yes, in some disciplines, the textbook is very expensive, but you know, it, where, like students in the UK, where the big expenditure comes is from fees, for instance. And then sometimes the attitude towards the, the textbook is not, it's, a, it's like a recommended reading list, but you don't really have to buy it. And overall, I think um, the latest figures from the government speak about, um, on average, a student would, would only spend £100 in textbooks a year. So it's not, while it is important, it's not, it, it cannot be the only, uh, the main argument that, that, that we use to, to talk about open textbooks. So I was part of a, um, I was giving a workshop where I was introducing open textbooks and I was talking about, yes, we were talking about cost, but I was much happier talking about the idea of engaging students. And I was actually using your anthology um, as, as an example of how the students can actually be involved and engage and create something themselves. And that's how they should, what they, you know, I thought it was a much more interesting proposition to talk about open textbooks, but not the cost argument. Um, but this is where the sad story comes in. As in one of the people who was what, a lecturer, one of the teachers or the educators, whatever you want to call them, at the workshop says to me, yeah, that, that's, that's great, uh, but you know, it's, my students don't want to learn, my students just want to sit there, they don't want to be engaged, they just want to, they just want to, they, they just want me to give them the information and they don't want to do anything, um, which I thought was, you know, I don't know what, I don't know this person at all, I don't know how his classes work and what it is that he does, but I thought that was immensely sad that you had that view. So how do you trust your students uh, or how do you not trust your students to actually get to that point? See what I mean? Um, I thought it was incredibly sad. Yeah, I mean, one, I hear that question all the time and it's a, it's a real one. And it's also not, you know, it really happens. Like, so I've had plenty of faculty come to me and say, I did open pedagogy and they hated it. That's real. That does happen. But when that happens, I think what that demonstrates is the compliance culture that we've built in education. So when you get pushback from students who don't want to be agents of their own learning, that's not on them. That's not their failure because they're lazy and they don't want to learn. That's because we have succeeded so brilliantly through, you know, many years of compulsory education that they've had before they come to us, and even in our own classrooms, you know, to train them. Uh, yeah, so Anna's right there, right? We've turned them into customers. That's really sad. I mean, we celebrate the term customers in some 
um, you know, in some parts of the of the university, right? So at the same time as we say that we don't like them behaving in that kind of transactional, like I pay you, you better teach me kind of model. Um, we also like I've heard language um, in my own work where they say, you know, we bought. 20,000 students now and you know what they mean is we bought a mailing list of students so that we could market to them to hopefully enroll them in our college because our enrollments are declining um, but it's part of this marketing and branding thing that's happening in response to some of these budget crises that students are very much treated like customers um, and our pedagogies match that in lots of cases and, and have you know, I mean, you can read Kathy Davidson or uh, Audrey Butters or whoever on sort of the historical trends that have produced the mechanized education that we that we have inherited. So when I get pushback from students, I try to first take a breath and remember these are these are good students. They've learned well, and we they are modeling for me that my paradigm shift is a paradigm shift. And that if I am able to affect it a little bit, it's going to really change things. And that I find kind of like a pep talk to myself um, because it's it's true that students, you know, have have a hard time. Um, so first of all, I would suggest that you take faculty seriously when they talk about that, um, and also consider sometimes pushback from students is the first step towards building agency. So sometimes when students push back and they say, you know, we pay you, you better give us that lecture. I say, you got it. Like you just said, here's what you need to learn. And like, I have a PhD in that and I could totally give you a lecture and it's gonna be awesome. I'm good at lecturing, right? So I think sometimes helping them, you know, ask for the kinds of things that will help them succeed. Um, can be a little bit of a step in to getting them to see that they are uh, participants in the creation of what the learning structure looks like, right? They're not just ready to receive knowledge. Um, but it's not easy, that's for sure. I know that the chat's going live. I, I can't, um, so I won't catch up with all of it, but um, let's see. Student satisfaction doesn't correlate with performance, exactly. I mean, we've really struggled with that now. And actually, David, um, I'm like, what's his name? David Wiley, <laughs> open content. Uh, David Wiley and Don Hilton are doing some assessments for our open ed initiative that we have in my university system. Because we tried for years. Like, we could assess cost pretty easily. And of course, in OER, that's easy. And you win fast, right? So like, that's awesome. But after assessing cost, we really struggled to assess the efficacy of learning in these ways. Well, this is what you guys know. You're trying to solve these problems. Thank God for graduate students because, you know. Um, but David and um, John, particularly in our program, because our, our Open Ed initiative has three wings. Um, you can do OER, you can get money to develop projects in OER, open pedagogy, and or open access publishing. So when they are assessing us, we asked them, please don't just assess OER and cost um, and maybe like throughput rates and stuff like that. We want you to assess the pedagogy, you know, and tell us what effects this is having. I don't really know how they're going to do it because I'm not an assessment guru. Um, and we tried a little bit internally. We got lots of qualitative um, uh, feedback from learners that was really exciting and we've published that. Some of it is on openpedagogy.org, this new site that Rajiv and I, Rajiv Jangiani and I made to feature open pedagogy projects and assignments. So I, I suggest you check it out, but one of the things we published early on there was a, a student um, perspective on learning through the open pedagogy channels that we had opened through that initiative. But I think David and John, um, might have some interesting things coming out uh, when they publish their assessment of our pedagogy stuff later this year. Great, any questions? 
Um, any questions from the chat, guys? Three people are typing. How much freedom from my institution do I have to experiment with pedagogy? Okay. Well, it's always fun to answer these questions while I'm being recorded. Um, so let me be diplomatic, and here I'll go. It's really hard. It's really, really, really hard. Um, hi. Um, I'm really lucky because I direct an interdisciplinary studies customized major program and I am a faculty of one so I have like high autonomy in this program as its director and its only faculty member and since I took it over the uh, three years ago we've grown from 10 students to 135 so we're one of the biggest programs on campus now and I will not have quite as much autonomy as we grow, but, but it's very, very cool because I'm able to now hire people who also have this commitment to open PED. So that's awesome. What I've been trying to do, though, is sort of, so right now I'm kind of like a college within a college. It's very piloty. It's very experimental. It's, it's innovative and cool. I'm not so interested in innovative and cool. I'm interested in public universities. I believe that these are animating ideas for mainstream public ed. You know, I don't want to go somewhere and create a niche program for elite learners or motivated students or a particular demographic. So that's where I have a lot more problems. Scaling, I've done a pretty good job system-wide and statewide in New Hampshire, but I'm having trouble at my own institution trying to bring this into the fabric of our mission. Our mission now is a little bit focused on um, corporate partnerships and private partnerships and research um, and uh, intellectual property and patents. And like those are the kinds of diction that we're hearing as a way to dig ourselves out of a budget crisis. And those are a little bit in conflict with the diction that I use to describe you know, where I think we should be going. So it's, it's a challenge. Um, if a student does not want to do a blog, I'm just going to keep going because they're going. Uh, what alternative assignments do you offer or suggest to them? Yeah, so I'm very blessed. And I think it's harder to do this work in a one-off course than it is in a program. So because I have a program and a little bit more time to deal with students, I take a good chunk of time at the beginning of their intro semester with our with our program to really go through this stuff and to go slowly and to talk about the difference between a tool like Twitter and a tool like Mastodon and open source software and what that means and then to talk a little bit about why you would or would not engage in social media for example um, because we're able to go slowly enough, by the end I ask, so students have a requirement to build a personal learning network in my class, but they can do that in multiple ways. For example, I had a student um, who had cancer this semester and he ended up doing most of my course from the hospital and he was not in a place where he was going to be like, you know, blogging and tweeting and whatever and instead he was studying physical therapy. So he actually built a personal learning network out of the people who worked in the hospital, you know, like face to face, asking the kinds of questions you might not normally ask if you were just interacting with somebody. Um, so really what I try to do is put the critical questions at the front. We read Audrey Waters um, about domain of one's own and why you might want to work on web, but we read people like Andrew Reichard talking about, you know, do I own my own domain if you grade it? Um, we look at the different tools available. We talk about the limitations and safety and privacy pieces of the LMS. We talk about the data that's collected in the LMS and how it's visible to me and not to them. You know, we talk about all those things. And then I don't really give them alternatives. I say, you know, here's a, here's a pathway that works for me. What's yours going to look like? And so 
people kind of carve out what works best for them. So a lot of them end up with their ePorts. Um, but like I said, some of them just end up uh, doing more or less the same stuff you do in an ePort, but they do it in Moodle in the ways I used to teach my classes with discussion boards and, and whatnot. Um, so I think for the most part, I try I try to present like a vision of alternatives as part of the reason I show them Mastodon and talk about it. You know, it's a Mastodon's pretty much like Twitter, only just open source and uh, it, because it doesn't have that commercial, you know, profit center, it, it functions a little bit differently. So I try to show them some of what's out there because they're they don't really know necessarily. But really, what I do is just ask them to ask questions. You know. Luckily for me, all of my students have different fields, you know, everything from data analytics to physical therapy to, um, you know, permaculture to whatever. Um, so I can't presume to know what works for the communities of practice that they need to engage with. So what the, the place an artist goes to work on the web or in life is very different than the place that a pre-med student goes to work. Um, and the standards for what makes collaborative learning in those fields is very different. So I try to show them in our intro course that you need to learn that stuff, right? You need to, you need to see what it looks like. You need to test it out. You need to watch people. You need to talk to people. I'm going to help you find those channels. And then you're going to build architecture as you go, you know, based on um, what you're learning. At the end of the semester, I try to remind them, like, it's time to curate. It's time to delete stuff you don't like. It's time to get off platforms that didn't work for you. It's time to write a reflection for the next student, you know, to help them, you know, um, learn from what you learned. Um, I see we're running short on time, so I'm going to answer one more question. You're probably also sick of my voice. Uh, back to digital open text, how do you overcome the I got to print it and scrawl all over it need? So again, I don't, I don't really try to overcome it. I basically, because we use hypothesis and they can annotate in the digital text, I say to them, hey, you probably don't know if that works for you yet unless you try. So you know, maybe give it a shot um, and use this semester as an experimental semester to see if you can you know, you, use some electronic practices that work for you. Um, but I'm really not so much against printing. Um, I, I, you know, even with OER is one of the things I talk a lot about. There's, um, there's some communities for which, you know, printing makes much more sense. I certainly have students that struggle with broadband access um, after hours when they're not on campus. So, you know, print, that's fine. Um, I actually had a student who like actually submitted everything to me in hard copy form, which was like so alien to me at this point, you know, but um, he created a portfolio um, that was like in an old school binder, like that's, and he was super knowledgeable about technology. That's why he didn't use it, right? I mean, the more you know, the more you know why you don't want to use it in some ways. So that's what he had chosen. And I was, um, I was, I was fine with that. I. I do push back on, you know, I always have students at the beginning of the semester, I'm not going to use Twitter because it's stupid, people post cat photos, and I'm like, dude, you can look back through my 40,000 tweets and you won't see one cat, you know, like, don't say what you don't know. So I like them to have knowledgeable, um, you know, knowledgeable commentary on the choices that they're making, and if they don't have enough knowledge to make a choice, I say don't make a choice experiment, you know, think about it, learn some more. But yeah, printing, printing's all good. I, I just try not to prescribe as much as, as possible. Um, sometimes students beg me to prescribe, just tell me what to do. And I'm like, okay, I'll tell you, you know, you asked me to tell you what to do. I'll tell you, do this. You don't like it, stop doing it, right? I, I also love scaffolding for students. I'm happy to sit right next to them and help them as much as they want, um, including giving them places to start if that's if that's what they value. Um, yes. I'm going to ask you, thanks Robin, I'm going to ask you to take one last question and that was Steve's um, 
um, he says it's a practical sort of question. How many students are in the classes where you're developing student sources or your, how would expectations change? Do you see that one? Okay, I just found it. Um, how many students are in the classes where you're developing student sources? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so I've talked, so in my own classes, I tend to be um, in the 25 to 45 zone for students. Um, but I do a lot of faculty development across all different kinds of campuses now. And I've worked with um, people who teach uh, courses of hundreds of students and ha have very effectively used open pedagogy um, in, in those uh, courses. I worked with a faculty member at our flagship institution, University of New Hampshire. She had hundreds of students in a big nutrition class and did absolutely great work with student-created um, OERs. So I think, um, I think it's just about how you sort of manage that. But to me, a word that might be helpful is the word curation. So even when I'm only with 20 students, they can't all be creating OERs that all go into this textbook. Like, it would just, there'd be too many things that weren't great and that we didn't really want to include, and then there'd be too many things in general. So you can have students work in groups of whatever, where they all create stuff, and, whatever, and then they curate amongst themselves, and that curation can go up you know, to a chain so that by the time it comes into the OER, you maybe had 400 students, but there's only a couple of things that sort of make it into that final OER. But I find that the process of students reading each other's work for evaluative purposes to figure out what needs to go into a text is, is super awesome. And the reason is um, because, you know, they're not just doing the thing they do on the LMS where they're like, oh, Sally, that, that post is really good. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> or, um, you know, I don't, I disagree because I think blah, blah, blah. Instead, it's curation for purpose. So it's not just what's the best thing. It's what gap is there in our text that we need to cover so maybe that the smartest thing actually isn't the thing that you curate into the text because you need a particular thing for this area. I think that that ability to critically look at um, each other's work and to get past a kind of like grammatical quality control thing, like a mechanical quality, and instead ask like, what what purpose is this work serving and what purpose could it serve? I've found those questions really awesome with students. So we spend a good amount of time at the end of each semester engaged in a kind of um, ballet of curation. And most of that I don't, my nose is not in it. So I don't see it at the ground level. I don't, I don't see all, I don't read all the stuff that they read. By the time it comes to me, I'm seeing a smaller cohort of stuff. So I think that kind of balletic, um, management could allow you to let your students work together a lot more and produce their stuff and then curate it into a point where you'd actually be able to um, you know actually manage the flow of, of work um, um, there's I'm going in I'm conscious of the time there's a very interesting comment from Erwin um, about uh, revolution education <laughs> and ditching bloom Woo! anyway but I'm not gonna get into it uh, <laughs> simply because it's already it's already past uh, 3 p.m. here in, in in Ireland which is the same thing as, as, as the UK so um thank you so much um I always end this kind of I always feel a bit mean as in stopping the conversation when it's getting going and it's it's brilliant so do continue the conversation if you want on on Twitter. Um, huge thanks, big hug uh, to Robin. It's been fantastic. With I mean, awesome. Oh, thank um, you all. It's such a pleasure. I'm so happy, and I I I really encourage you to um, come at me. At uh, I mean, don't come at me, but like tweet me um, anytime or put your people in touch if. Um, if you think I can be helpful to people. So I'm happy to, to talk more. I will. Um, so for everybody else, just two quick announcements. Um, so we're back 
in July. Um, it is going to be Bernard, but I can't see if I can say his name properly, Bernard Nkuyubwatsi. Uh, who is a Goji and alumni, so he's gonna he's gonna uh, be talking to us in in July. Um, it is not gonna be the first Wednesday in July, I'm afraid, but it will be mm, some Wednesday in July. I will confirm with you um, as as soon as he gets back to me. Um, the other thing is that put it in your diary, guys. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah 19 is happening in Galway, Republic of Ireland. Next April the 10th and the 11th, so I want everybody doing their best. You start saving, get your piggy banks. If you put in like a dollar a day, you will be nearly there by the time we get to April next year. So you might as well just put in two dollars or two pounds in your piggy bank every day. So that's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Robin. Thank you uh, from the whole corners of the world. Thank you. Good night. Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon. It's been awesome. I'll see you all next month. Bye-bye.